So this is a teaching video on, I'm just going to run through the Math 140 exam one concept list that I handed out in class this last week. I think this could become an important document for a lot of you as I talked about in class. Um, a lot of this stuff you know, but maybe don't know it quite well enough, and or you know it, but it's not always in the front of your mind, so you forget about it as you're doing a test or quiz or something like that. So I'm going to run through it and just... Um, First of all, make sure you're clear on all, this, all the things, all the concepts on this list, and also help you to make connections. Okay, so here we go. Uh, tools for simplifying expressions. First of all, order of operations. Order of operations are used when an expression has mixed operations so if you have um, addition and subtraction and multiplication all mixing together with some parentheses thrown in possibly some squares and um, other powers that's when you have to pay attention to order of operations and it's um, the first priority is grouping symbols you do anything inside the grouping symbols first Second power is, or second priority is exponents. And third priority is multiplication and division. And fourth priority is addition and subtraction. Those things go together because um, subtraction can be turned into addition by just adding the opposite, and division can be turned into multiplication by um, multiplying by the reciprocal. So that's the order of operations. Now, there are things on this list that help us, in a sense, ignore the order of operations, and we'll talk to that when we get them, but you want to keep um, this in mind, this in mind, and that in mind. When, we, when, we're, when we're applying the cumulative property of multiplication, cumulative property of addition, or distributive property, that allows us to um, change the priorities of order of operations. Okay. Now let's talk about them right now. So the cumulative property of multiplication says, as, as I put here, any order. So if I have a string of nothing but multiplication, I can multiply them in any order. So for example, if I have... Um, 3 times 5 times 10 times 2 or whatever. Um, I could multiply 2 and f 5 first because that would give me 10. And that would just make it easier if I'm trying to multiply my head. So then that would give me 3 times 10 times 10. Notice I don't multiply the 2 times the 5 and the 10 and the 3. That it's just, I'm just rearranging the order of multiplication. They're still all being multiplied together, but now the 5 and the 2 have just become the 10. So I continue to multiply, and of course 10 times 10 is 100, and then 3 times 100 is 300. So that's applying the commuter property multiplication. But even if there's division involved, um, if we have, for example, 3 times 5 times 10 times 2 over 5, well, the grouping symbol, if we follow... Um, Order of operations, we would have to do all this top stuff first and then divide by 5. But the commutative property of multiplication says that division is just multiplied by reciprocal. So I can, if I divide, I can do that. In, or I could divide the 5 into the 5 first if I wanted to. As long as there's nothing but multiplication and division. So, um, or I could divide the 5 into the 10 if I wanted to. So I could rewrite this. If I divide the 5 into 10, I get 3, 5, whoops, sorry, 3 times 5 times 2 times 2, because the 5 and the 10 cancel, right? And then I would have 2 times 2 is 4, possibly. 4 times 5 is 20. 3 times 20 is 60. Okay? So that's, um, and, and that also applies when it's, when there's variables. So if we have uh, 3 times x squared times y times 
over y cubed times z to the third. Okay, when I look at that problem, I notice that it's nothing but multiplication division, so the commutative property of multiplication applies. So um, I can multiply or divide in any order as long as I'm keeping track of what's dividing and what's multiplying. So for example, I could take care of the um, I could take care of the y's first, right? Because that's, um, and that would leave me with just a y squared on the bottom. And there's nothing else that can be simplified. So I would just have 3x squared on top and y squared z cubed on the bottom. Okay, so that's the multiplication, our commutative property of multiplication. Uh, we also have commutative property of addition, and that would be like if I have 3x squared plus 7x squared minus 2, oops, that's a funny looking 2, 2x squared plus 7x minus 3 plus 4x minus 10 or whatever, you know. So again, if I have nothing but, but, nothing but addition and subtraction, I can apply this because I can turn any subtraction problem into a add the opposite. So really when I look at this, I think of this as 3x squared plus 7x plus a negative 2x squared plus 7x plus a negative 3 plus 4x and plus negative 10. So when I think of it like that, then I can do it in any order I want. And then this is where like terms comes in. We can only add and subtract like terms. And like terms have the same um, variable, variables, exponents, and numbers in the radical. The only thing that can be different is the, the integer coefficient. Or I should say rational coefficient. Okay, so anyway, come back down here. So we're looking for like terms. And notice the first three are like terms, so I can go, uh, I can add in any order I want. So like negative 2 plus 3 is 1, 1 plus 7 is 8, so that'd be 8x squared. And then down here I have a 7x and a positive 7x and a positive 4x, that'd be positive 11x. Then I have a negative 3 and a negative 10, so that'd be negative 13. Okay, so that's community property of addition. Distributive property applies to multiplication and multiplication and division. So that means, um, again, this is a way to get around order of operations. If I have a number on the outside, like three, or, or a term on the outside, multiplied by multiple terms on the inside. So that's where I would apply distributive property. Or if I had the same idea, x squared plus 3x plus 4 divided by 3x. So because you can think of this as, um, this is like a parenthesis, and I'm multiplying by 1 over 3x. That's the same thing as that. Um, and so what the server property says is if I have this situation, instead of following the normal order of, our, order of operations where I'd have to add everything inside the parentheses, which I can't because they're not like terms, I can multiply the number through the, or the outside term through the parenthesis. I multiply it by all the terms on the inside. That's why they call it distribute, because you're distributing the 3x through. Then I can drop the parenthesis. So you go 3x times x squared, which would be 3x cubed plus 9x squared plus 12x. Or in this case, I would, the x is canceled there, so this would be like 1 third x, or, a, or just x over 3. This would just be 1. And that last one would be 4 over 3x. Right? 
the distributive property. Uh, as far as X minus go, the multiplication rule, um, I'm going to say it, but not write it, because if you're having trouble with the multiplication rules, I would forget about them and just follow the definition of exponent. So, but in the meantime, multiplying rule, the that's if you're multiplying powers then uh, that have the same base, you add the exponents. If you're dividing powers that have the same base, then you subtract the exponents. And if you have a um, if you're raising a power to a power, then you multiply the exponents. Okay. Now, if those are working for you, great. If they're not, forget about them. When I look at a problem like this, like, whoops, 3x squared y squared times 4x squared um, z all over two um, x y cubed. Now, in that case, I think some for a lot of you, the the rules are not that helpful because you, it gets real confusing. So, if you're unsure about the rules or where do they apply or when to use them, then forget about the rules and just do expanded form. Meaning that I look at this and I say, I know that this first one here, this first parenthesis is squared, which means there's two factors of it. So on the top, I really have 3x squared y times 3x squared y. Or, and but because you can multiply in any order, you could think of this as 3 times 3, which is 9. And this is x squared times x squared, which is x to the fourth. And this is y times y, which is y squared. So that would take care of that whole thing. Come over here, and that's just 4x squared z. Go down to the bottom, and this, of course, is 2xy times 2xy times 2xy. But since it's multiplication, I can do it any order I want. That would be 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. x times x times x, which is x to the third. And y times y times y, which is y to the third. Again, so far, I notice I haven't used any rules. I'm just kind of expanding them out and bringing them back together. So now I look up here and I think, again, I don't need any rules for this. I look at the top and say, okay, how many fact or look at the whole thing and say, how many factors of X do I have? Well, actually back up a second. Let's look at the numbers first. So if I look at the numbers, I have an eight on the bottom and a four on top. Those things can cancel. So that'll leave me with just a two on the bottom. And of course that nine is still there, so I'll have a nine on top. Then I look at all the X's and I count the factors of X, right? This means multiply by X four times and multiply by X twice. So that's a total of six. Um, and there's three of them on the bottom. How many Y's do I have? Just two, whoops, sorry. And three on the bottom and one Z on the top. Now I look at the top and bottom together and I say, okay, there's six of them on top and three of them on the bottom. So three of these will cancel three of those. So I will have just three X's on the top. And here there's two Y's on the top and only and three on the bottom. So these two will cancel with two of those, leaving just one. And then finally there's just a Z on top. And again, I did a lot of that stuff in my head. If that doesn't work for you, because you want to ultimately get these right when you're done, right? So if it if the whole if what I did in my head didn't work, what you can do here is like I said, just expand them out. So this is going to be three x squared y times three x squared y times four oops, times four x. Oh, times 4 x squared z. Now at the bottom I have 2 x y times 2 x y times 2 x y. If you need to do that, do it. Because ultimately you want to get these things right. Okay, so then once I do that, then I see more clearly the factors, right? 
So that x and that x will cancel out that x. Um, and that x will cancel out one of those x's. So ultimately over here I have one, two, three x's, x to the third. Okay. And then I see that this y cancels out that y, this y cancels out that y, but there's one y left. Yeah. Um, I see just one z on top and nothing else anywhere else. And then I see a 2 times a 2, which will cancel out a 4, and a 3 times 3 on top, which is a 9, and just a 2 left over in the bottom, which is a 2. Okay. Again, you want to do what it takes to get them right. Okay. So that's the idea of powers. Um, then, of course, when we're doing powers, negative exponents is really important to understand that x to the negative 1 is 1 over x. So likewise, x to the negative 2 would be 1 over x squared. But if you're sitting in a fraction, like x to the negative 2, y over x to the third, z to the fourth, okay? So it's a little bit cumbersome to just turn that x to the negative 2 into 1 over x squared on the top of the fraction. But if we understand the way reciprocals work, if I have a fraction on the top, I can... It's, a, it's really like the top is on the top and the bottom is really on the bottom. So another way to think of it, and that's why I put wrong place here, is I just think of that and say it's in the wrong place. x to the negative 2, if I want to, I can rewrite it as x squared on the bottom. So again, what happened here was this guy went right down there. And notice when I put him down there, I dropped the negative sign because he's not in the wrong place anymore. And then once I do that, of course, I can simplify y. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 factors of x and 4 factors of z. Okay. Fractional exponents. Uh, the key to that, remember, is that the root is on the bottom. So x to the um, 5 thirds, for example, would be the cube root of x raised to the fifth power, or x to the fifth with the cube root on the outside. So it doesn't matter which order you do them, you can cube it first and then raise the fifth power, or you can take the fifth power first and then cube it, cube root it, I mean. So um, if I had something like 27 and 4 thirds, so that means it's I'm taking the third root of 27, which would be 3, but I haven't applied the power yet, so I put it there. 3 to the fourth power is 81. Okay. So now we're doing this all oh, going on 18 minutes. Okay, I'm going to get the simplifying radicals in, and we'll be done with this video. Okay, simplifying radicals. No perfect square factors inside the radical. That means if I'm looking at a square root like this with a um, 20, let's say a 50 x squared y to the third. When I look at that, I realize there is perfect square factors in there. Meaning like, for example, 50 has a factor of 25, which is a perfect square. So what I've been doing in class, I think, is I usually break it into two radicals. So I put a 25 there and a 2 there. Put an x squared, y squared there, which leaves a y here. So in this stage, it's nice. This is a nice little in-between stage because you can still see, check to see if everything's there. So two times twenty, <coughs> excuse me, two times twenty-five should be fifty, um, and the x squared is still there. And y times y squared should be y to the third. So yeah, sure enough, they're all there. But then my next step would be just to take the square root of everything inside here. So the square root of twenty-five is five. Square root of x squared is x, and the square root of y squared is y, and that took care of this whole thing, and then I'm left with the square root, oops, sorry about that, I'm left with the square root of 2y. Okay. okay, so then part b can multiply two different numbers that are both under a radical. That means if I have the square root of 5, 
times the square root of 6, that would be the square root of 30. But if I have the square root of 5 plus the square root of 6, that is just the square root of 5 plus the square root of 6. I can't do any more with that. So I can simplify when I'm multiplying two radicals together. And again, if you come back to here, this is um, these are not like terms, are they? Whenever we add things, they have to be like terms. Okay. Cannot um, cannot cannot add terms with radicals unless yes. Yeah, so that's this is referring to this up here, right? So it's good to see those two together. I can multiply things. So even if it's the square root of x times the square root of y, I can't multiply x and y, but I can rewrite that as the square root of x y. Okay. And then last but certainly not least, divide by a radical by rationalize the denominator. So when I have 8 over the square root of 2, for example, um, the only way I can do that is by rationalizing the denominator. And what that means is I multiply top and bottom, or I multiply creatively by 1, as I say in class, but I multiply top and bottom by the square root of 2. And so that would give me um, 8 times the square root of 2 on the, on the top, and then rad 2 times rad 2 is just 2. But then I notice I can simplify that further, so that would be 4 rad 2, wouldn't it? Okay, and that's true if it's an x. If I have 3x over the square root of x, right, I'd multiply top and bottom by the square root of x, and that would give me 3x rad x all over x. And of course, the x is canceled, and that would be 3 rad x, wouldn't it? Uh, one other thing with this, um, when you're multiplying... If you're dividing by a number and a, a rational and an irrational, so if I have like, for example, 8 over rad 2 plus 1, I can't just multiply by the square root of 2 because that would leave a radical um, in the denominator. So this is where I multiply by the conjugate. So you would multiply by square root of 2 minus 1, square root of 2 minus 1. And that would give me 8 rad 2 minus 8 on top and again the reason why we do this is rad 2 times rad 2 is 2 and the middle terms add together to give me 0 and then 1 times negative 1 is negative 1 so I end up with 8 rad 2 minus 8 all over 1 which of course is 8 rad 2 minus 8 okay so when you rationalize the denominator you just multiply top and bottom by the radical oh and keep in mind this came up on one of the quizzes, I think. If I have 8 over, I don't know, 4 rad 3, I don't have to multiply by 4 rad 3. I just, have, I just multiply by rad 3 and rad 3. Okay, that gives me 8 rad 3 over... This is a bad example because I would have just canceled the 4 and the 8. So let me do a different one. Sorry about that. So if I have 8 over 5 rad 3, let's say... I don't have to multiply by 5 rad 3, I just multiply by rad 3. And that would give me 8 rad 3. 5 times 3 is 15. And that would be my final answer. Okay, cool. So that's the end of this video. I will make another one talking about dealing with fractions because that's the next topic. Um, but I wanted to get this up there quick and get it posted. All right. Hope you're having a good one.